I'm so excited to get up here and tell you about royal family. I forgot that we had the story of Jesus bumper to show, show there. Before we get to the story of Jesus, I do want to encourage you to stop by the table in the back. There are reps from Royal Family Kids Camp who serve from our church there, some leaders. And there are some great opportunities to serve. You can serve for a whole week. It, c it comes in the summertime. Or there are even some day opportunities if you uh, can just give a day. So stop by and talk to the reps back there. They're wearing the purple shirts. And I hope that you will. Well, our year-long preaching theme is the story of Jesus, and we're preaching our way through the Gospels, uh, the early life, the early ministry, and now the prayer life of Jesus of Nazareth, and today we wrap up a series that we've called Teach Us to Pray. We've been looking at what Jesus taught us about prayer, as well as a few examples of how he actually prayed himself. And we looked at two parables that he talked about, uh, that Jesus told about prayer, the parable about the persistent widow who just kept after the judge until she got the justice she was looking for, the proud Pharisee who saw religion as a kind of competition, and he prayed that way. Then we saw the, the humble tax collector who just cried out to God for his grace and forgiveness. We looked at what's called the high priestly prayer last week with Pastor Jeff. We looked at the Lord's Prayer to start the whole thing off a few weeks ago. And today we're looking at two texts back-to-back -back in different Gospels uh, where Jesus is teaching about what I'm calling the power of, and mystery of prayer. The first text is found in John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. So let me read these for you. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, the first thing we notice uh, about that brief text is the last line. Ask me anything in my name, and I'll do it. We, we respond, wow, that's, that's some kind of statement. But first, before we get to that, let's understand the context. Here in John 14, if you read it, uh, the whole chapter, Jesus has been talking to his disciples, uh, the 12 men who followed him most closely, that he's going to soon be leaving them. And they don't understand what he's talking about. Uh, they are hoping at that time that he might become king, but he st starts talking about his departure, and they're worried and they're confused. They don't understand yet that the cross and then the resurrection uh, lie just ahead. So Jesus is assuring them that although he will be leaving them physically, he's going to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit so they can continually have access to him, spiritually speaking, through prayer. So that's what he's talking about. Now let's go back a bit. Uh, to a different text, to what Jesus has already taught his followers about prayer. This is in Luke chapter 11, uh, beginning in verse 5. Let me read these verses to you. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is, he is a friend, yet because of his impudence he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For, whoever, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? All right, now let's try to put these two great texts together and see what Jesus is teaching us about prayer. First, I think we see that He's teaching us that God wants us to ask. And He wants us to ask like children ask. If you're a parent here um, today, my guess is you're going to kind of recognize elements of this next story I'm going to tell. I've told it before. I don't remember exactly when, but it's one of our very favorite family stories. Uh, way back when one of our boys was only about, oh, about three years old, he developed um, kind of an extraordinary love for apple juice. I mean, um, kind of a strange love of apple juice. It was all he would drink for a time in his life at about age three. He drank so much apple juice, we became concerned, so we started cutting it with parts water, so we, he would drink less of the actual apple juice. Uh, and he especially liked to have a cup of apple juice in the middle of the night, about 2 in the morning. Uh, he'd wake up, I'd wake up about 2 in the morning every night 
to the sound of his voice calling out of his bedroom just across the hallway, juice, juice. And it got to where it was so routine that, that I actually started that I'll, how, how, if, you, if you know what it's like to be a young parent, okay, I would actually make the little cup of juice before I went to bed. And I would put it next to my bed so I'd have to walk all the way downstairs. I just have to walk in and give it to him. I thought that was brilliant. It wasn't so brilliant. Every night, 2 o'clock, juice, I take him the juice. Um, I won't get into how I actually got suckered into getting up every night, but he trained me to do that every night. Um, part of it had to do with the fact that there was a baby in the next room over, so that if he yelled loud enough, the baby would wake up, and that would just compound my whole uh, middle of the night. Um, so I would get him the juice, he'd go right back to sleep, I'd go back to sleep, okay. Eventually, my wife and I kind of realized that, that that probably wasn't the best idea. It's kind of crazy that he really should be sleeping through the night at this point. The inmate was running the asylum. So I decided that this particular day would be the last time that I would, uh, that it was the final night was over. He calls out, Jews. I walk into his room and I say, um, son, I'm, uh, I'm not getting you juice tonight because you're a big boy now and you can sleep through the night. Jews. And it goes louder and louder. Now I got a real problem because he wakes up the baby. Now I have, and then my wife wakes up. Now I got all kinds of problems. So I tell him, okay, okay, shh, shh, last time. <laughs> right? You know, a parent, you know what I'm talking about? Last time. Get the juice, come up. Last time. Give him the juice. He's nodding and said, last time, right? Last time. I turn around. I take one step away. And he goes, that was before I got the juice. I, I, I'm getting ready to go downstairs. And he goes, dad. I turn around. And in the darkness, he goes, and a graham cracker. Because <laughs> he's got me now, right? He's only three. And a graham cracker. Last time. I take two more steps to the doorway, and I hear, Daddy. I turn around, and I just see two fingers sticking up over his bunk beds. And two chocolate chips, he said. <laughs> that was the last time. He went a little bit beyond the boundary there. But when children ask for things, can I have juice? Can I have a new bicycle? Can I have the car keys? Several things are true. No matter how old they are, no matter what they're asking for, children ask because they want something, right? They want something. They don't think about whether it's good for them or bad. They just want something, and often they will confuse their wants and needs. And as adults, we can do that too sometimes, can't we? Confusing wants and needs. Children also tend to be very persistent when they want something. They can ask over and over, and they will wear you down. That's the whole strategy. Just wear you down. My son learned that at age three. And finally, children ask because they believe that mom or dad can indeed deliver that which they're asking for, right? They have faith. My three-year-old son had absolute faith that I, as his father, had the power, the authority, the resources, and the extraordinary gullibility to get him what he wanted, right? To get that juice. Now, most of the time, we as parents are not offended when our children ask for things. We're not offended. We may not get them what they want, but we're not offended when they ask. Jesus is saying in the same way, God wants us to come to him as his children. He's like a father who wants to give us good things. Listen to what Jesus said. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Of course not. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? But notice, He also, in the previous text we looked at, in John's Gospel, taught that we are to ask in His name. Back to John 14, Whatever you ask in My name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask Me anything in My name, I will do it. Twice He says, ask in My name. Now what's He saying here? Does He mean that we are to use the phrase in Jesus' name, tack it under the end of our prayers, and poof, get whatever we ask for, kind of like a magic formula, abracadabra? Of course not. He's already warned us in other places that we aren't to pray babbling like pagans. They aren't, aren't to try to turn prayer into some sort of magical formula. Of course not. In James chapter 4, in the New Testament, we read, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, as I said before, like children, we too can ask out of mistaken priorities. We can mistake our needs 
for wants or wants for needs. We can ask for the wrong things for the wrong reasons. So to pray in Jesus' name is not just tagging his name onto our personal wish list. That's not what Jesus is talking about. So what does he mean? Three things, I think. First, he means access. To pray in Jesus' name means we have access to the Father. When I was a young boy, um, just between the ages of, say, five and nine or so, we lived in Akron, Ohio for a time. So therefore, the first football team I ever followed, was aware of, was the Cleveland Browns. Any Brown fans in here? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I see that hand. But they weren't the sad, sad, sad sack Browns that of today. These were the 1964 world champion, NFL champion, Cleveland Browns. All my heroes, Hall of Famers, Jim Brown, Lou Groza, Paul Warfield, all pro defensive end Bill Glass, who also was a part-time preacher evangelist in the 60s, and since then he's led his own prison ministry all over the United States. He'd actually spoken at our little church in Akron that, that my dad pastored, so we knew Bill Glass and his family. Well, the summer after they won the whole NFL championship, when I was about eight years old, my dad took us to see the Browns training camp, uh, and somewhere along the line as we sat there, I have vague memories of this in, in my head, uh, we're sitting there watching a practice, and it's probably because of Bill Glass we were going to go. Uh, somewhere along the line, my dad got the idea to get us boys, my brother and myself, autographs of the Cleveland Browns. I guess he figured if he got the Bill Glass, who was a friend of his he had met, we, he'd have a chance. So before my mom could stop him, my dad hopped over a security fence that separated the field from the spectators, climbed out over a, a, one of these chain link fences, jumped onto the field, and walked straight out onto the practice field. Just, just my dad. Um, and so he's looking for Bill Glass, the player, but he can't see him anywhere. And so he just, he just walks up to the first person that he comes to, and he recognizes who it is from a picture in the newspaper. It's Art Modell, the owner of the Cleveland Browns. Now, he's never met this man before. This is a millionaire, owns the team, and my dad, being my dad, just goes for broke. He walks straight up to him, and he doesn't lie, but he pretends that he knows him because he recognizes him. He walks up, Art, Art, Rolling coffee, good to see you. Like that. And he said he could see a flicker on Art Modell's face of, I don't know this person. But he also saw the guy decided that he would go for broke too because he couldn't take a chance of uh, not knowing somebody he, that he knew. And so he goes, Roland, Roland, good to see you again. How you been doing? And my dad was in. So my, he goes, how can I help you? And my father goes, I'm looking for Bill. Is he around? He goes, I think Bill's in the locker room. Let me take you there. So the owner of the Cleveland Browns takes my dad into the locker room of the world champion team, and he got an autograph from every single player on the team on one piece of paper, except for Jim Brown, who was in a lawsuit at the time he wasn't at practice. And for years, I had that in my dresser in my room at home until I think my mother sold it in a garage sale when we moved. So if you have a, it's all in green ink, so if you have that in green ink, it's mine, okay? But it's about access. To pray in Jesus' name means that we have access to God, God the Father, through our relationship with the Son. It means we have access to the power and resources of God through our relationship with Jesus. On the basis of what Jesus has done for us, on the basis of our faith and what he's accomplished on our behalf, we ask on the basis of the gospel. Think of it this way. If someone comes to me and says, hey, Brian, uh, could you do this for me? I might and I might not, depending on what it is. But if they say, you know, I've known your son for the last two years, and I think he's a great guy, could you do this for me? That changes the equation a bit, doesn't it? The nature of the relationship changes things. whole different story. So it means access. Secondly, to pray in Jesus' name is also authority. To pray in and with authority. Sometimes I wonder, especially if I'm reading certain writers or just at moments in time, I wonder if I have any idea sometimes who it is I'm talking to when I pray. A writer named Annie Dillard has written, Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? When we go to church, we should all be wearing crash helmets. The ushers should pass out life preservers and signal flares, not bulletins. They should lash us to our seats if we knew who it was we're talking to. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Colossians, He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. We have to know who it is we're speaking to when we pray in Jesus' name. The Lord's Prayer itself begins with our Father, relationship. 
but it also recognizes the authority of the one being spoken to, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. So when we ask in Jesus' name, we're asking according to his relationship with the Father, according to his authority, we're approaching the authority of God himself. So to ask is authority. Thirdly, to ask in Jesus' name is also to align ourselves with his purposes and his will. Back to the Lord's Prayer when Jeff taught it to us. It includes the phrase, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if you're like me, when you say those words or hear them said or read them, it's most uh, natural to think of uh, thy will be done on earth, earth as in the whole world. So we tend to think of you know, that wars would cease, that suffering would end, that justice would be done. And that's true. That's part of that prayer. But it's equally true that we're praying that to be true in our lives. Thy will be done in my life. Thy will be done in my heart, in my relationships, in my priorities. To pray in Jesus' name means to surrender ourselves completely to the will and purposes of God himself. Only then does the Lord's Prayer move to give us this day our daily bread. The Apostle John further elaborates in 1 John chapter 5 when he writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, the name of Jesus, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the gospel. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. He wants us to ask. He wants us to ask in Jesus' name because God the Father wants to give us good things. That's the second point today. God wants to give us good things. Here's a question. How do we know anymore what's good for us and what's not so good for us? I mean, how do we know? One day, things like sugar and caffeine and chocolate, by the way, pretty close to my three main food groups, but those three things one day are, are not so good for us. Avoid those things. And then you read a blog or something, and it says, really, those three things are not so bad for you. In fact, if you eat dark chocolate, it's actually good for your heart. Uh, uh, that's the last thing I read anyway, so I'm, I'm depending on that one. How do we know? Every day there's a new food or a new exercise or a new thing that we thought was not so good for us, now we think it's good for us, or something that we thought was bad for us. It's all confusing. You know, this has been going on for a long time. I did some research just for fun, to find products that were once sold in our culture as health products, as good things. Now we know not so much. For example, have you ever heard of vitamin donuts? <laughs> True story, 1941, the Donut, um, Association of Amer donut Corporation of America tried to market vitamin donut donuts for pep and vigor. That's a good idea. To, I, I, I'd buy that. How about 7-Up for babies? <laughs> I didn't make this up. This is real. 7-Up uh, in the 1950s tried to encourage mothers of young children, babies, to pour 7-Up into their milk because it was so wholesome and clear. Not to mention the sugar. Or how about this ad for cigarettes back in the 1930s? More doctors smoke camels than any other brand. You know, there was once a popular cough syrup at the turn of the century that had heroin as the main ingredient. Evidently made people forget about their cough. I don't know how that works. Jesus is teaching us that God wants to give us good things. But how do we even know what's good for us? How do we even know what to ask for? Notice, he says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. What's he talking about here? He's saying that the best gift he can give the Father has already decided. Jesus has already decided. The best thing he can give us is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, why the Holy Spirit? Later on in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 8, Paul explains. He writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And that's a beautiful passage. It's a whole series of sermons, just that one paragraph. But for our purposes today, Paul is simply helping us see the role that the Holy Spirit plays in our experience and our practice of prayer. 
Let me try to illustrate this with a story. I think it illustrates what Jesus is trying to teach us here. Years ago, uh, when I was working my way through graduate school as a young single guy in my mid-20s, uh, the focus of my prayer was the f- my future, which any young person can understand. Even, even those of us in the later life can understand. We think about the future. We worry about the future. We wonder about the future. Where is God taking me? I believe I had a call to ministry at that time in my life. I believe he was leading me somewhere. I just couldn't see it. And it was frustrating. Month after month would go by, and I, didn't, I couldn't discern where he wanted me to go. And I'd pray and pray and pray. At the time, I had two professors, as I was working my way through grad school, that uh, I was really impressed with. Both these men were just wonderful men, were wonderful teachers. I loved their spirit, their intelligence, and both of them had gone to Fuller Theological Seminary in California. So I did a little research and found out that Fuller had this wonderful program that seemed to be designed specifically for me and my interests. I could go there, and if I got accepted, I'd have five years of study, come out with a double, with a PhD and a master's degree of divinity, uh, a double degree, and it was both things I was interested in. Perfect. That's it. I f- felt like God was leading me toward that, and that's what I prayed for. So I filled out the application. I noticed when I read the information that they were only taking nine applicants for the following year into that program. And I prayed with due compassion for all those people who get the rejection letters, but I, I applied. Okay, a couple months later, I get the little thin envelope in the mail. I had not yet learned the difference between a thin envelope and a fat envelope. You know the difference. Thin envelopes are rejection letters. Open it up, and I was astonished. I was surprised. I was shocked, and I was also angry. Because I felt like that had been it. I had even given, given up my job for the next year at this university where I was working. I felt like God had pulled the rug right from underneath me, like it was some sort of cruel trick. I don't want to spend another year in Upland, Indiana. I wanted to do something great for him. He knew that. I told him that. Well, I scrambled around, found another job, stick around Taylor University one more year. At least I had a job. Well, two months later, I met a student who was also assigned to work in the admissions office, and her name was Lorene. I discovered that out in all my prayer, for my will, God said no, 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 because he wanted to give me something else, something better. That's what Jesus is trying to teach us here. Jesus gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is about the intersection of our prayers, our desires, our needs, our wants, and the sovereignty of God in our lives. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gives us his own presence. He teaches us how to pray as we ought. He teaches us even what we should pray for. And he helps us understand and see how God sometimes gives us something else. That leads us to the third point that I think Jesus is trying to teach us about, and that is, what about unanswered prayer? What about unanswered prayer? Back to the text in John 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. My guess is, since I read that the first time, 18 or 20 minutes ago, some of you had already been formulating in your head a very large question. And you might not have blurted it out here. I mean, after all, we're in church, and I'm giving the sermon. You might have come up to me afterward. Maybe you would have written me an email. Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, the question you want to ask is, what about times when he doesn't? What about unanswered prayer? What about times when we come to God as his children, when we pray in Jesus' name with pure hearts and pure desires, when we're asking for something that seems to be clearly something that God would want for us or for another person, and nothing happens? What then? Many of you will remember about six years ago, my father uh, had a major stroke. It happened on a Sunday morning. Uh, about 5.30 in the morning, I get a call from my brother. I was preparing to come to church and preach here at the East Campus. And uh, my brother said, Dad's had a stroke. Doctor says there is zero chance of meaningful recovery. They'd seen him. They'd examined him. Zero chance of meaningful recovery. Stop breathing at home. Stop breathing in the ambulance. All that stuff. So my brother and I talked for a little bit. And through tears, we decided if that's what they're telling us, uh, tell them them we're going to let him go. We'll unplug him. Tell him let him go. That's what he would want. He he, He doesn't want anything else. We knew. He'd been quite clear. But about 20 minutes later, i just gotten out of the shower, get another call from my brother. He said a second doctor had seen the images, the films, and the whatever it was, the scan, and believed we'd been given incorrect information, believed that his condition was, in fact, reversible if we choose to do a certain procedure. 
We talked again on the phone, decided to authorize the procedure, and to make a very long story short, they did it. They drilled a hole in his head, released all the pressure, and over the course of the next three, uh, couple days, my dad woke up. Over the next month, recovered completely. Drives, plays golf. You've seen him here. He visits every now and then. Uh, it, was just, it was miraculous, and we celebrated. All during that time, we prayed. All during that time, thousands of people all over the country prayed who knew my dad throughout the years, my family. We celebrate. To this day, we celebrate. Part of that story you probably don't know is that just a few weeks later, probably about a month after we were sure my dad was recovering, a lady came up to, for prayer at the uh, West Campus on a Saturday night, I believe it was, and she told me her own story. She knew about my father, and her story was almost the same day, same weekend, that my dad had a stroke, her father had a stroke. They prayed. They did the procedures, and he never recovered. He passed away. And she wasn't bitter. Her question there simply was, how do I understand my unanswered prayer over against your answered prayer? When we pray and nothing happens, does it mean we've done something wrong? Does it mean we've, a- we've asked for something that's wrong that God doesn't want? And if God's going to do whatever he's going to do, he's sovereign, why pray anyway? Why are we doing it? It's helpful for me here to remember that Jesus himself prayed an unanswered prayer. We don't often think of it this way, but on the night before he died in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, if, it, if there be any other way, Father, let this cup pass from me. With such intensity that his sweat was like great drops of blood. Let this cup pass from me, yet the Father didn't answer that prayer that way. But rather, gave him something else. Sometimes our prayers go unanswered, Because we ask with wrong motives, we understand that. If we ask selfishly or for things that aren't good for us, God the Father, like a good father, a good mother, won't give us what we ask for if it's going to hurt us. Sometimes God wants to give us something different or better that we can't see right now. Sometimes God is simply saying, not now, or wait. And that's because sometimes he wants us to persevere to persist, to continue in prayer. Because there are things that we can learn as we persist in prayer, as we endure in prayer. There are things that we can learn about ourselves and about Him that can only be learned through persistence and persevering in prayer. So Jesus is teaching us in this short series, through His own modeling of prayer, through His own uh, thoughts and words, that prayer is first and foremost a relationship. It's not a religious performance. Prayer is personal. It's not some sort of magical formula. Praying in Jesus' name means we have access to God the Father through our relationship with the Son. It means we've surrendered to His will in our hearts and our lives, whatever that might be. And the greatest gift we receive is the Holy Spirit who dwells in our hearts by faith, who teaches us how to pray, who teaches us what we ought to pray for, and who helps strengthen and encourage us as we endure in and through prayer. And finally, with all that being said, in this text, Jesus is telling us clearly that God wants us to come to him as his children. And he does invite us to ask him, to ask him anything. 